All right, we are moving on to part four now. One thing that's very important, if you're jumping into this episode and you haven't listened to the prior parts of this letter, it will make zero sense to you. So go back to the very beginning and listen to everything and then catch up to this point so you'll understand what, what I'm reading exactly. All right. The next section is called shunning. Once many were instructed, I was a suppressive or confused or whatever the story was, I experienced radio silence. I now understand that you are in so-called full shunning mode, shunning friends, your family, your spouses, your beloved children. It's heartbreaking to them, by the way. I want you to know shunning is actually a myth. You are the only people shunning. The inner circle is not. Shunning is how they keep you from getting any data from the outside bubble. They, on the other hand, are actively associating with people that have left. Keith Raniere, Claire Bronfman, Nancy Salzman, B and S are actively interacting with those that have left by proxy. How, you ask? Through a campaign of intimidation and violence, thinly veiled as what has been termed terrorism by litigation. How can that be, you say? We're a nonviolent organization. In lip service only. Many people experience the organization as an empire of revenge. Many know anyone who rejects Keith Raniere will face a vengeful god. Look at what they do, not what they say. That was the first and greatest advice an exit counselor gave me when I left. Read about the long history of litigation, threats, harassment, spying, professional surveillance, and much, much more. Why is Mexico quiet? Do you think it's because all is well? No. It's like when the narcos are running things. The town folk are very obedient. Why? They're afraid they'll be killed. Am I afraid I'll be killed? Well, I'm a dead man walking. I have a target on my back. It began being painted on me the minute I thought for myself. There are dozens and dozens of people in Mexico who are terrified they'll be killed. A few of them have already been threatened by the upper ranks. Those threats are backed with high society, vast amounts of money, armed guards, and political power. One Mexican journalist who reported extensively about ESP, Nixium, DOS, etc. got badly beaten up recently. Coincidence? Maybe. But I'm from the third world. That shit happens every day. Believe me, the leadership in Mexico understands the fear of violence. And then I wrote this quote from the film I made, Encender el Corazón. And the quote was from Keith Raniere, where he says, Fear is the tool of violence. It's never the violence itself so much that is the problem. It is the fear of violence and how fear controls people. Such an interesting quote, because literally he was talking about, you know, the, the cartels, etc., that were doing these things, and he was literally using the same playbook. The next section was called Whistleblower. Now, let me just explain. I'm going to talk about somebody called Tony Zaratini. Tony Zaratini is an amazing, amazing man. He's a dear friend of mine. And Tony went through a very harsh experience when he was much younger. He was kidnapped for, I think it was over 180 days, and the kidnappers... Um, you know, cut his ears off and sent them to his parents, cut a finger off, sent them to his parents, all in order to extort them to pay them money. And um, Tony had come to ESP to help, you know, to get help with all his trauma. So he became a dear friend of mine and then got targeted the minute he began asking questions and speaking out. So this, this section is called Whistleblower. Tony Zaratini accused of extortion. Tony Zaratini, a hero, a man who has been through more than any Nixian Mexican I know, and now the Mireyes have been after him? Why? Because he had a problem with DOS. So, using the tactics of other high-demand groups, never defend, always attack, they attacked him on another unrelated and entirely fabricated front, an invented crime of extortion. Apparently, he tried to extort $2 million so as not to reveal industrial secrets. Seriously? Do you honestly believe he would do that? Does he look like he really needs the money? Really? Or was it maybe a strategy to shut him up and everyone else who tries to be a whistleblower? The Mireyes have so far silenced many in Mexico. I shake my head. 
at the violence and the stupidity. You are complicit in ways your arrogance does not allow you to see. You are enablers of the worst kind, protecting what seems to be your lord and master's sexual and devious control appetite. The world, which has far more conscience than you, will not forget. In the Harvey Weinstein era, history will not look positively on this moment. To quote another line from the film Encender el Corazón, that's the film that I made, it's not a cool thing. You're a chicken, a coward, and you've hurt other people. There's a fascinating coincidence about these additional people accused in November 2017 of this non-existent extortion. The people that received threats from these Mexican lawyers and attorney general were DOS slaves who escaped, people that spoke about DOS with grave concern, and an extremely reputable New York Times journalist who wrote about DOS, people who don't know Tony Natale, Joe Hara, et al. These DOS slave escapees and whistleblowers are accused of demanding money from Nixium. B and S. Do you think it's not completely obvious to many you are going after people who have problems with DOS while you say you knew nothing about it? I believe you did know. How else would you know who to target? A particular DOS slave escapes, terrified, and you decide to terrorize her further, a young girl. It's not enough she's traumatized and afraid for her life. Are you stupid or just plain cruel? In the best case, your lord and master instructed you and didn't give you all the details and you obeyed blindly. In the worst, you are truly malevolent and are now in the game of terrorism. I'm not sure which one it is. The blame game. Many of you know there are severe problems right in front of you, but you're looking in the wrong place for the cause, as was I. Many times I would go to Keith Raniere and point out issues in the company and what needed to change. He would explain how the women were all socialist and talk unkindly about their issues, basically blame them for all the problems. Nancy, Lauren, you, Kathy, Loretta, you received the brunt of the blame behind your back. The skinny young things, not so much. So like trying to map good slate of hand, I was always looking in the wrong place. It's difficult to get anywhere when the target keeps moving. It's crazy making, isn't it? Lauren, he would tell you that us versus them was a problem. So you'd correct, punish people who pointed out problems. Then he would tell somebody else us versus them was essential, how it's how you protect the community. It must have been confusing for you if you were trying to find the deep unifying principle. If you assumed you were being fucked with, much easier to understand. And then there was the way some of you talked about each other. You, Lauren and Claire, the unkind words about Nancy. Lauren, your nasty sentiment towards Claire, and quite frankly, pretty much everybody that didn't agree with you. I read some of the text you wrote after I left. And Sarah, after cautioning me about dishonorable speech, how did you stand by when the Greens and Executive Board said such nasty shit about me and the others? Where did you file that away in your psyche? But the true genesis of all of this is the one place no one wants to look. It's right in front of you, in plain sight. Most of you believe, like I did, that Keith Raniere has created these advanced tools for civilization and all the upper ranks, especially the women, are cocking it up and ruining his mission. What if that's not true? What if you are pawns in a game you've been disabled from seeing? It's in plain sight, but you have to develop the eyes to see it, and you won't develop it inside the bubble. Did I know the full scope of everything two years ago? No. I was a loyal soldier like you. The final piece of the puzzle fell into place in April 2017. What began unraveling? A blatant lie I witnessed that I could not return from. A woman I know, young, attractive, sexy, etc., told me she was being repeatedly hit on by Keith Raniere. She felt afraid and creeped out. Her one personal interaction with him at volleyball was very strange. According to her, he walked off the court mid-game and fawned lustfully all over her. Then weeks later, he repeatedly reached out to her on social media and wanted to desperately Skype with her. This was confusing to me. I tried to Skype with him for years, and he said he didn't Skype. Record scratch. I challenged him on these events. 
I told him to stop hitting on this girl as it was scaring her. He said he only reached out once. Lie number one. But that one turned into a cascade of them. I experienced another lie, then another. It finally occurred to me, a startling thought. What if there were many lies? Later, I heard from many, many women who reported on his voracious, impulsive, childlike need for power, control, and sex. To say I was devastated is a gross understatement. I believed for over a decade I was standing guard outside the equivalent of the Star Trek Federation, the noblest endeavor of my life. Instead, I realized I may have been standing guard outside the equivalent of a brothel. The appearance of calm. What was confusing for my first decade was that Keith Raniere had the appearance of an unruffled calm at almost all times. If one were mystical, one might confuse this with some kind of enlightened stage of humanity, if one didn't understand what you were looking at. There are two notable times I saw Keith Raniere lose the calm and to get extremely emotional and giddy. There are more, but these two contexts are interesting. One was a discussion about sex. I introduced him to an actress who he got very excited about. He told me afterwards about her personal sexual escapades with rock stars and members of royal families. You know, eyes wide shut meets hustler kind of stuff. He seemed excited like a kid in a candy store. A few weeks later, he told me the exact story again, as though he had forgotten. I thought it was strange. Why this? Why was this so thrilling? The other time was around March 2017 when we were taking a walk. He said something which sounded vaguely principled. I replied to him that he could be a complete psychopath and say those same words. He got excited. He said something to the effect of, I could be. Let's say I was. I was struck by how stimulated he was by my comment. Thrilled even. V-Week 2016. Now, I'm about to talk about um, Jim Del Negro in this letter. And um, maybe people don't know this, but Jim actually passed away. Um, he was following the medical advice of Keith Raniere and went to a clinic and I believe he died, um, I think at the clinic. So, you know, I have lost an incredible friend, um, but one who was unfortunately still loyal to Keith Raniere. V week, 2016 at V week, a startling thing happened that was a major red flag and grew in me like a virus. The story is for you, Jim. You, the soldier who feels like you cannot question your master. I remember you weeping about the... Ooh, this is hard. I remember you weeping about the beauty of the Founding Fathers. You are a good man. At V Week, as we were trying to fortify a flailing SOP, Jim, Nippy, and I made the decision with Keith Raniere that we would meet him every night by midnight, and if we failed to do that, we would stand for a certain period of time outside his cabin. One particular night, we went to his cabin, and he wasn't there. Right before the appointed time for us to meet him, I decided to go and explore with my high-powered flashlight to see if I could find him. I shone my flashlight into a number of nearby cabins, and eventually spotted him in a cabin, in bed, with a girl. Queasy and a little stunned, I slowly went back to where Jim and Nippy were standing and said absolutely nothing. When I finally told Nippy recently, he was furious. Jim, I've never told you this. It should give you pause. It's disgusting that we were standing like soldiers for our general who was in bed with a girl. I know you'll find a way to rationalize this, like, he sacrificed his principle of SOP to heal a young girl. What a beautiful sacrifice. Let me just state that when I say girl, uh, she was young but not underage, so, you know, a woman. I learned later he was having sex with numerous different girls throughout V-Week. Do you know, he once told me that if he did not have sex often, he would begin to become light, almost slight and detached from the world. So... It was essential to ground him. Goodness, if only I'd used that line in high school. Now, by the way, just as a, as a comment on this, it was so confusing because 
everybody called him a renunciate, you know, who was not attached to, to you know, anything in the material world. And yet, um, much later, I'd been there for a long time when he began saying, oh, you know, I, I have to have sex to ground myself materially, but, you know, and he was sort of intimating that he wasn't attached to it anyway. So much bullshit. You lovely woman who have pledged yourself to a deity, your Lord and Master is keeping you like little children. You are incapable of basic decision making. If I asked you, Nikki, Lauren, you, D, Nancy, N, Allison, D, about taking a step on something, you could not decide. You have to check every single thing with your Lord and Master. You have abandoned yourself as the center of your universe. You have made him the center of everything. You have become no thing. Somewhere, you're still inside there, maybe yearning for freedom. The education made you think that was weakness. Allison, you've almost run away multiple times. D, you didn't want to come back last time. N, you want to leave so bad but feel trapped. Nancy, you feel relieved when you leave. Esther, you love time away. You know something's wrong. You watched Allison try and seduce Jim. You believe the only way to achieve enlightenment is to have sex with Keith Raniere? H, you'd escape to New York City, and they'd say you were running from your breach. Maybe it's time to talk about what your breach is, according to the inner circle. Your breach, apparently, is that you wouldn't have Keith Raniere's baby. See? When you say it out loud, it sounds really twisted, kooky, and messed up. Because it is. For that, you were held back in earning, reputation, rank, etc. Anybody would be miserable under those circumstances. Then you were punished for having a bad attitude. There's great value in not compartmentalizing information. The data has a chance to breathe in the bright light of actual rational thinking, also known as, what the fuck, that sounds crazy. The next section was slavery, remember Africa. While on the topic of slavery and indentured servitude, I'm horrified by some of the things I see going on with the woman in DOS. Michelle Hatchett, you believe wholeheartedly that DOS is the answer to civil rights issues? You are a woman who has inherited the injustices of centuries of slavery, and you've been led to believe that branding and the suppression of women will lead to the betterment of the African-American struggle? The evidence that you are perpetuating the most insidious slavery is lost on you. Remember Mother Africa. Remember the struggle. This is not the way. You do not need mental shackles for greatness. Nothing great or noble was ever achieved through blackmail and lies. The entire structure of DOS is built for secrecy and lies. It's not structured for honesty and goodness. You've all been led to believe that lying is good. It even began to show up in the VW question sets. You believe you are the noble ones protecting the Jews in the basement, that you have to lie to the Nazis. When you look at history or even science fiction, there is usually the cold, sterile force in control, and then there is the resistance. In World War II, there was the French underground. In fictional Star Wars, it's the rebel alliance against the Galactic Empire. Protectors of DOS, AKA the VOW, the agency, the project, I want you to know, despite your strong belief that you are the resistance, you are not. Only inside the bubble do you think you are saving the world. Outside, everyone sees what you are doing as dangerous, kooky, abusive, and destructive. The enablers. There are two kinds of enablers. The women who have pimped for the sacred cock, and then the male enablers. You are the men who got wind the whole thing was blowing up and hid under a rock or became combative. You got really angry and defensive, almost like you were protecting DOS. Why? Well, it's come to my attention that some of you may have been part of the Eyes Wide Shut Club. Were you using DOS to get off? Were your threesomes and foursomes fed by this fucked up slavery porn group? You're on the wrong side of history, bros. And you call yourself protectors? 
It was a very, very strong statement. Um, what happened is I discovered in 2017 that there was this, all this stuff going on. You know, everybody was like, the education was, you know, against satiation, rise above your body. But then there were all these like, there was this weird like hookup group of people that were going around, you know, having threesomes and God knows what. what. And I just thought to myself like, what the fuck is going on? This, there's this weird shit that's going rampant. Anyway, that's for a whole other topic. Your future selves. Well, my rant has come to an end. As I said, that is 0.5%. I'm well aware that this long letter may not move any of you. Too many EMs and the knife. Also, some of you may be true believers. But at least we can collectively never look back and say I didn't express this. That I didn't try. I'm writing this hopefully to your future selves who will look back at this maybe years from now and say, holy shit, it was right in front of me. More and more information will be disclosed that will startle many of you. At first you will be convinced it's all part of the big bad conspiracy against your beloved Lord and Master and his innocent minions. But the revelations will grow and grow and be more and more shocking. Then you will have to face the horror as well, as many of us have. It will take significant decompression and time. We will be there when that day comes. We will help you. You may never talk to me as long as you live, and you likely won't, but do one thing. Read one book. Take Back Your Life, Recovering from Cults and Abusive Relationships by Yanya Lalich and Madeline Landau Tobias. And then I put the link in there. It will change your life. It may even save your life. I miss many of you deeply. All my love, Mark. And then I had a PS at the very end. PS, I predict another process statement will be made shortly along the lines of cherished community. Criminal elements are sending messages from the outside world. Now more than ever, we need to pull together as a community. Civilization as we know it depends on it. Our love and honor and nobility binds us, and we must, as a matter of principle, deny hate. Do not participate in this campaign of hate and lies. Do not breach your most important and cherished values by reading any statements, ideas, or thoughts from them. That will grow hate. What we need is love. And then I said at the very end in bold, I encourage you to question, who would benefit from calling my thoughts hate or lies? So that was my letter to the inside. And understand this thing I talk about, this, this hate that I, I imagined what they would say. And they said stuff actually very similar. Um, it was doublespeak. They, they called anything that was going against them um, a hate campaign. And they termed what they were doing. And even when I was still inside, Keith Raniere came up with this, this, this concept of we're, we're in a war against hate. And so you were led to believe that anything that went contrary to the belief systems of your organization was part of a hate campaign. And that what they were doing was love. And of course, it was complete doublespeak. It was completely the other way around. So this letter was interesting. I sent it out. And I sort of waited. And I, th I think what I was expecting was so many people to contact me. But not as many did as I thought. Now, bear in mind, I sent this letter to a lot of my friends in the lower ranks so that have, they'd have time to talk about it before reporting it back up the chain to the upper ranks. Um, I found out that the upper ranks did read it. Um, I found out that... It was, you know, completely negated pretty much. But I will say that I think probably less than 10 people reached out to me, absolutely horrified and wanted to talk. And they were just in shock. Um, but the letter was marginalized. And, and the, the, the reasoning was that I was angry. And that if in, in anybody who said anything and had any emotion other than neutrality, was, t was vested. And so I was vested, you know. The other um, criticisms were, there was a story going around for a long time that I was a weak-willed man, and, and this was their rationale. Basically, they were accusing me of giving in to the woman's unreasonable demands. And the unreasonable demands was they felt abused. 
and that I was just buying into it all. You know, I was, I was a weak-willed, uh, I think one guy even called me pussy-whipped, that I couldn't think for myself, and I was just thinking, you know, I was thinking the same thoughts as the woman that left that were just, you know, gossipy complainers. And I thought it was so interesting because I was very, very proud of the position I was taking, but I thought it was so interesting that they couldn't even hear me, that they couldn't even hear the idea that these women truly were abused and some really bad things were happening to them. So that was really interesting. And then, of course, this... this other thing that was pushed was that I was the architect of all this shit. And that continued even in court. The argument that the, the, the defense was using, that Ranieri's attorneys, Ranieri's five attorneys that I was up against, the argument that they were using was that this was my conspiracy that I had created. And somehow I had embedded myself in this organization 12 years prior and had spent all this time waiting to finally blow it up for fame and fortune. So that was interesting, complete and utter fucking bullshit. And that's what uh, I, I then learned about the term DARVO, uh, which was termed by uh, Jennifer Freyd, a professor of psychology in, in Oregon. DARVO, deny, attack, reverse victim and offender. And so basically what they were doing was, you know, they were saying Ranieri was innocent of everything and everything was all us. It was all us just concocting bullshit. So that was interesting. And I think um, I am curious to see how some of you uh, respond to part two of the vow, um, you know, during the trial. That will be very interesting. I think if there's anything else that's important about these letters. I think reading these letters will, will spark a lot of questions. Uh, again, this letter was written for people on the inside. It was my last desperate attempt to get them to, to wake up. So... Some of it may seem like, well, what's he talking about? And please, you know, feel free to, if you want me to expand on, on certain things, I, I might. Uh, some stuff I'll, I'll save for my book, but, but I might expand on certain things. Um, I don't really want to talk about the personalities involved. I think it's much more interesting to talk about the patterns. And I think there's a lot of things that occurred in the indoctrination process in Nixon that's very common in, you know, in romantic relationships in families, you know, in other cults, in churches, in corporate environments, in political parties, in entire countries. So I think that is a lot more interesting to me. My general feeling reading this is um, such sadness because, you know, I wrote this, you know, back in March 2018. Um, I mean, it's over four years since I wrote this and sent this letter off. But I think sadness because um, many people, I think, have not processed. They're either still very loyal and they refuse to look at any of the information. Understand, there were loyalists sitting in court listening to everything. And their conclusion was still that Keith Renier was innocent and all these people were somehow bad. I mean, that I found astounding. But I think there's a sadness as well because there's the, the campaign against all of us, but for, I'll speak personally for myself, the campaign against me, the smear campaign against me, was so profoundly effective that to this day, there are many people that I love dearly that do not want to talk to me because they feel that there was a better way for me to handle this. And some have said this to me, or I've heard this, you know, some people say, well, why didn't you just talk to Keith? And they don't seem to understand. I mean, I could just say, well, that's fucking stupid, but Tr truthfully, they don't seem to understand. You can't actually have a reasonable conversation with somebody who has that kind of pathology. You're going to get nowhere. You know, but I think it's very, I suppose it speaks of their naivete maybe and their, and their goodwill perhaps that they think that they re that really was an option. You know, it's like trying to negotiate with a lunatic um, that you know, could cause enormous damage and is absolutely crazy. The only, the only kind of conversation you could have is, is, is one that where you have more leverage over them than they do over you. But in this case, you know, Ranieri had access to hundreds of millions of dollars. And to this day, it seems, based on some news that's just come in, it seems he still has access to that kind of money. Um, you can't reason with a person like that. And I'm sorry that they 
feel that there was some better way. Um, I wish there was, but there wasn't. You have to, you have to deal with these things in a certain way. So I have sadness about that. I have sadness that that many of them, uh, I guess, truly hate me, or whatever the reason is. You know, I miss I miss a great many of them. So I hope this gives you some insight into some of the things that were happening behind the scenes. There are many, many things that occurred that did not show up in the vow, uh, part one. You know, that was nine hours long. There was, you know, years and years of stuff that happened that's absolutely fascinating. I mean, there were fascinating things that happened in this battle. Um, I will talk about some of them, you know, in the future, but just know that there was a lot of stuff that that the public does not know and, and the press does not know. That is utterly fascinating. Thank you for listening to this long, long letter to the inside. And we will talk soon.